Uh, well, listen, I'm excited this morning. I asked my brother John to preach the message this morning, and I'm excited because I know he's got a good word from the Lord. He's he's a he's a Bible student, amen, and, and he's not scared to preach the gospel in an age and a day when maybe men are a little bit apprehensive to tell the truth. Praise God, I don't believe that he's apprehensive to tell the truth, amen. So brother, if you come up here and share what the Lord's put on your heart, I'm excited to hear what God's got to say, amen. amen. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Sister Lily, for being obedient. Sister. With this, trying to put this together, even waking up at five something in the morning to, to try to put it together, thinking to myself, you need to find something else quick. <laughs> um, but I appreciate that obedience because I believe that goes right along with what the Lord has put on my heart. Yeah, uh, Sister Lily, I appreciate you and your obedience yes. in, in all that you do and in, in praying for people and, and all those things and in the obedience that, that changed Trey's life to yes. be obedient. That one yes. moment when we as an individual can hear from the Lord and it's surrender and obedience, right? Yes. And, and who knows how it can affect yeah. an individual's life. So thank you for that. Yeah. And to everyone that's faithful. Amen. Because I haven't always been faithful. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. I haven't always been faithful. Oh. Goodness gracious. I know I'm not alone there, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. I'm not alone because I know I know humans and I know people. I know what we are. And the, the, the old covenant shows us all about the, the faithfulness of God and the unfaithfulness of man. Yes. yes. And I'm here to tell you that, that the God on the right side of the book is the God on the left side of the book. And the people on the right side of the book are just like the people on the left side of the book. We are no different. We are no different than those people in the Old Covenant. And our God, He is no different than that God of the Old Covenant. He's the same God yesterday, today, and yes. forever. Yes. Uh, I'm going to do my best to, to bring across the word this morning. But first, I, I just want to thank Matt. Uh, the truth is, Matt, Matt's my best friend. He, he's, he's my best friend. Um, we talk a lot. And uh, sometimes we don't like each other after we talk. <laughs> Anybody have friends like that? <laughs> Sometimes we talk and we'll talk daily, and then I know I know we'll go like four or five days without talking, and we both know it's because we don't like each other. At the moment. <laughs> and for him, we, we have many disagreements, and, and a, a lot of times we butt heads and we clash about the Word of God and, and understandings and, and and things that we might see and we might think and that we just sometimes disagree with each other on, but it's never really. Nothing big, I don't think. Uh, we haven't come there yet, praise God. I know a lot of friendships have been split over the Word of God. But I think that if we as individuals can continue to pursue Christ, who He is and what He did, if we can continue to pursue Him for His leading and guiding in our life, that we would have Him set apart and sanctified in our heart, that even those little things that might separate us sometimes, that He would keep us yes. together. So I appreciate the fact that I can... Challenge him, and, and he'll still allow me to come up here yes. and share the word of God with you. Amen. Amen. And not, some preachers wouldn't allow That's that. Right. So I appreciate that. But I do have a, a funny moment that i got to share. Any of you who has ever sat under mass preaching before, 
for any amount of time will probably laugh with this as well. <laughs> Sometimes him and I like to go out and get a bite to eat. It's usually Mexican 99.99% of the time. <laughs> and I think it was after Bible study, <laughs> he knows what I'm about to tell already. After Bible study, we, we had went and had a bite to eat and um, we were talking and he said, you know, brother, he said, Sometimes I just feel like you preach a little hard. <laughs> and I just busted out laughing. And when I busted out laughing, he busted out laughing. And I said, I don't know if that's a compliment or not coming from you. Because <laughs> I've heard you preach. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. But yeah. I, I do thank you. I do appreciate you. I do love you. And I appreciate your faithfulness to what's going on. Praise God. Um, I want to preach a message this morning entitled The Altar and the Sacrifice. The Altar and the Sacrifice. Precious is the blood. Yes. Amen. Nothing but the blood. You can never go wrong with those old songs about the blood of yes. Jesus because that blood is still as powerful and it's still as relevant today as it was some 2,000 years ago and it will still accomplish the same thing today yes. as the day it was spilled. Yes. It's very, very, very powerful. Um, we live in a day and an age where that blood is being denigrated, it's being uh, desecrated, and it has been. And I've heard Matt use this word a lot about a lot, a lot of different things, that the blood has become a common thing. Yes. The blood of Jesus, the, the sacrifice of Jesus has become a, a common thing. It's always been a, a common thing to the world, but even in the church now, it's becoming a, a, a common thing. But I want to talk about this sacrifice, and I, I want to talk about this, this altar, if you will, and I want to talk about its relevance today in our hearts and in our lives and, and in our walks, how that the altar is still relevant to the sacrifice, and how that the sacrifice is still relevant to the altar. Um, I wrote something down. It's the cross that sets Jesus apart. And it sets Jesus apart because of the resurrection. Mm. And the resurrection makes a statement. The resurrection says that the sacrifice was good. Yes. Do you understand that? When he got up, it was a statement being proclaimed that what I did, when I said tell us not, when I said it is finished, it is wholly completed, it is done, it was done. Yes. And, and I want to, to encourage you in, to, in that this morning that you can rest assured that it is, it is done this morning, that it is finished. Yes. Amen. It is completed. What Christ came to accomplish, what he came to uh, fulfill in the prophecies, he did it and he completed that work. And the word of God says that he's seated on the right hand of the Father where he ever intercedes on behalf of you and I. And you've got to understand that he's not sitting up there begging the Father not to, not to pour out wrath and pour out judgment, but his very presence there intercedes on behalf yes. of us. Amen. Because he has sprinkled his blood in the Holy of Holies is what the Word of God tells us. If we can, let's go to Matthew 23 and verse 16 is where we'll start. And I'm not really sure how this is all going to play out. And do me a favor if you're working the, the um, computer back there. Don't take the, the scriptures off after I finish reading because sometimes I like to go back and forth. Um, we're going to pray real quick. Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. And I have nothing much to offer, Lord, except the hallelujah, like the song says. That's all I have is this life. And I ask, Father, that this morning, that by your spirit, if you will, that you move upon these words and upon our hearts and that you have your way. In Jesus' yes. name, amen. amen. Woe unto you. Can we go to the, uh, to the ESV? I'm sorry. Woe to you, blind guides, who say if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. Next verse. You blind fools, for which is greater the gold of the temple that has made the gold sacred. And you say if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. 
But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. And I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with this text, and I'm going to take us on a journey that would hopefully lead us to the place where you and I intersect with this altar. That my life intersects with this very altar. I want you to understand that every single altar that's ever been built in the Old Testament all the way up until the time of Christ was a type of the cross. That it was a type and a foreshadowing of Calvary. That, that very altar that Jesus would place upon his back and he would carry up the mount. And they would hang him on that tree. Every single altar. But I want to go back because this is one thing I do know. Not everyone in this building this morning is born again. Not everyone in this building knows exactly what the gospel is. So I want to travel back real quick and I want to look at a couple of things. And I want to make sure that we understand what the gospel is. The good news. Yes. Do you understand that it's, it's good news this morning, but I want to make clear that this gospel message, this good news is not good news to those who will reject it. Come on. Right. It's only good news to those who will accept it. Yes. Amen. But if you reject this good news, this good news becomes bad news for you. Yes. Because if it's true, according to this gospel, according to this foolishness that God would have us to speak, because that's what he says it is to the world. According to this, what it says is that you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. And one day you'll have to receive the wrath that I'm going to pour out on you because of your guilt. Mm. But good news, good news, there's good news. Yes. If you will accept it. So what we see, and we're going to travel all the way back to the garden. We see God, he created this man. We've all heard the story of Adam and Eve. God created this man, Adam, and he put him to sleep, and he took out of him a woman, a rib, and he formed a woman out of him, and he brought this woman to him, right? And he said, this, this is your wife, right? And we have man and, 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 and woman, and we have a husband and a wife. That's God's, uh, that's God's order of doing things. Amen. God's order is one man and one woman coming together. Amen. And they become a husband and they become a wife. And, and that's God's order. And that's under attack today. I want you to know it's under attack. It's under attack because God's under attack. Come on. And this is what they're saying. Has God said? Come on. That's right. Has God said that this is the way that it really should be? That's the attack. And it's nothing new because as we're back in the garden, we're back in the garden now. And God told Adam, Adam, you can, you can have every, every tree in here, the fruit of every tree in here, it's yours. But the day that you eat of this tree, surely you'll die. Surely you'll die the day that you eat of this tree. Well, one day it says the serpent came in and he was more subtle than any other creature. And he spoke to Eve and he told her, look. What did God say that you uh, you couldn't eat of the trees in the garden or something to that effect? I'm paraphrasing. Well, Eve turned around, she twisted a little bit, said something different, and basically what it what it says is that the the, the serpent told him, "Surely you won't die." This is what he was saying. Has God has God really said that? Surely you won't die if you partake of it. And she looked upon it, and she saw that it was good for food. And she saw that it was good to make one wise. And the word of God says that she ate. And then she gave it to her husband and he ate. And Romans 5 and uh, 12 tells us that through one man, sin entered into the world. So it wasn't through Eve, but it was through Adam yes. that sin would enter into the world. Because Adam, he was the federal head of the household. You know, there's an attack. There's an attack. On the, the, the man being the head of the household today. It's called feminism. Yeah. Come on. It's a very, very, very evil thing. It, it's an attack on the, on the order that man, that God has set in order for man and woman. And, and what these people don't realize is that if, if we would follow that order, right, it doesn't make man above woman. Come on. It actually makes them equal. Come on. 
Yes. Because God pulled that rib That's right. from the side. Amen. And when Adam named her woman, he said, because she is flesh of my flesh and she is bone of my bone, she is one with me. So sin entered in to the garden. We see that, that picture. So we have man's fall, man's disobedience. And when man disobeys, we see sin entering in as God has said. They find out. And then here comes the word says that, and this is where we get the, uh, we often say that God would come down in the cool of the day, right? And he would walk with Adam and talk about Adam. And it's from this one verse that we make that assumption because it says that God came down in the cool of the day. So what we do is we naturally assume that that's how it was. In the cool of the day, God would come down and he would meet Adam and he would walk with him and he would talk with him and he would fellowship with him, right? So that day, God would come down and fellowship with Adam and he would say, Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, we, we, we've hidden ourselves because we were naked. And God would say, who had told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? Right then and there, we know and understand that sin entered in and it caused a chasm. It caused a gap between man and God. And they were now separated fellows. Fellowship, it was separated between man and God. And you've got to understand that every single man from that day forward, every single man, every single woman, and let me just real quick, when I say man, 99.9% of the time, I'm just talking about the human race. Right, right. So when, when man came forth after that sin, the word of God tells us that sin entered in through Adam, and through Adam's seed that it was transferred. Yes. It was transferred Throughout humanity, it was passed down. It says about Adam that he was created after the image of God, in the, in the image and likeness of God. And it says about Seth that he was born in the image of his father. Yes. So every single individual, every single baby born, every single child, every single human from that day forward has been born with an indwelling sinful nature. And they're separated from God. You wonder why you think those things that you think. You know those thoughts that no one else knows about. Right, right. I know we're all good in here. And some of us actually believe that about ourselves. <laughs> but those thoughts that you think when you're all alone and when no one's watching and when no one knows what's going on in your mind. You know those thoughts and those desires that maybe you don't act upon, but they're there on the inside of you. Those very desires on the inside of you, yeah. even though you don't fulfill them. Listen, even though you don't fulfill those desires, even though you do not run after and fulfill those desires, I want you to understand that before God, you're just as guilty as the man who does. Come on. Because those desires point out what's in your heart. And those desires in your heart tells you that something is wrong, that there's an issue on the inside of you. But the word of God in Romans tells us that men suppress the truth, that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And because of that, God pours his wrath out. Come on. He says that he has placed on the inside of us something that would tell us that we are created beings. That we are beings with a moral compass. I want to make it clear that even humanity in and of itself, apart from God, can be a moral human being. It can do moral good. That's part of the confusion in the world today. And many will, will say, many will argue, are you you're telling me that I can't be good without God? I'm telling you, you might be able to be good in the eyes of the neighbor of your neighbor, but you'll never be good in the eyes of God. The best thing that you can do as an individual who is not born again is still sin in the eyes of God. Come on. If it is not a faith, it is sin. Yes. So the best thing that you can do in the eyes of a holy, just, and righteous God is sin in his eyes, and it's not acceptable unto him. Come on. Do you understand that? Amen. So what God did, he came down in the garden and, and relationship has been separated. And, and Adam would say, we, we, we put fig leaves on, we've hidden ourselves, our nakedness. 
That's what took place. But God said that's not good enough. And we know that God would coat them with a coat of skins. And right there was the very first sacrifice. And we see that that sacrifice didn't need an altar because God was the altar that set it apart. Come on. God was the one who made that sacrifice holy and righteous. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. This is when the prophecy began to be laid out yes. of God's plan for redemption. Do you understand that this isn't a plan that God just came up with one day and said, this is what I'm going to do. The word of God says that before the foundations of the earth, yes. before the earth was ever formed, before it was ever laid, that Christ had been crucified in God's eyes. Yes. That this was always going to be the plan that would be set forth to save us sinful humanity. Yes. And all throughout the Old Testament from that day, we see two things. Altar, sacrifice, altar, sacrifice, altar, sacrifice, altar, sacrifice, build an altar, sacrifice, build an altar, sacrifice. Abraham, build an altar and bring your son up there and we're going to make a sacrifice. A type of Christ. A type of what God would do to pay for the sinful penalty of man. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Altar. Sacrifice. Altar. Sacrifice. It says after Uzzah was killed when he went to put his hand upon the cart to steady the car as they crossed the, the threshing floor of the cart that they wasn't supposed to be carrying the way that they was carrying. And he put his hand upon the cart, the temple of God, where God's presence resided upon, among sinful man, that God struck him dead. David would weep and he would mourn and, and he, would, he would go and he was a little angry at first, if I'm not mistaken, but then he would weep. And he would mourn, and, and they would go back, and they would do it the right way. And they would, uh, they would put the, the stage in the, in, the, in the car, and they would have the, the priest carrying the car. And it said, I can't remember how many steps was it, Matt? Do you remember? Every six steps. Every six steps, sacrifice. Every six steps, sacrifice. Wow. Every six steps, blood. Every six steps, blood. It's the blood in religion. When the altar and the sacrifice is seen properly, it shows us two things. It shows us sinful, fallen man's need for mercy and grace. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. And it shows our holy, our holy God's willingness to provide that which fallen man needs. Thank you, Lord. Do you understand that? Two things. You need a sacrifice. You have a problem. I don't care that you've never committed adultery. I don't care that you've never drank. I don't care that you've never did drugs. I don't care that you've never did this or you never did that. I don't care what you haven't done. Come on. Because what is in you states you have a problem and you need a sacrifice. Yeah. And oh, you yeah. know that. Yes. Amen. You know that what's on the inside of you tells you that something is not right. Yes. Right, come on. And the world is trying to strip that away. The world is trying to take away the guilt that God has placed there. The moral compass that God has placed, the world's trying to take it away from us. Come on. And they say if it wasn't for religion, then no one would feel guilty about what they do. Help us, Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The word of God is under attack. The church is under attack. And what God is trying to do is under attack. But I've got good news. They don't win. Amen. They don't win. The only victories they have are the ones that God allows them to have. Come on. As a part of his purpose and a part of his plan. The word of God says he laughs. Yes. He sits and laughs at man's foolishness, at man's folly. He sits where he, listen, I want you to know and understand you got a God. While, while sometimes you're here and you're feeling attacked and you're being pressed in from all sides and you're feeling like you just don't fit in, first of all, you shouldn't fit in. That's right. That's good. You shouldn't fit in, right? So hopefully that's how you feel that you don't fit in. I know when I'm at work, man, I don't, I don't, I don't fit in. Hmm. I, I just don't fit in. I've gotten more bold. 
Uh, can you imagine that? <laughs> I've gotten more bold now in, in, in this gospel message, in this freedom, in this liberty, this victory that I have found in Christ. Or let me rephrase that, that Christ has revealed to me yes. this victory, this freedom, this grace that has empowered me. I've become so much more bold than I've ever been. And I don't fit in. Just this last week, I had a, a situation, and, and we had a lot of Spanish people where I work, so I'm trying to pick up little bits of Spanish here and there. See? Que pasa? What's up? Buenos <laughs> dias. Good morning. But it's not just good night. That's a beautiful thing to learn. Right? So I'm trying to pick up a little bit of it. And every now and then at, at work, I'll, I'll throw it out there a lot. And, and the other day, I was around two of the supervisors. And I, and I made a statement. I, I made a statement. I said a couple of words in Spanish. And the other supervisor said, the one guy, he agreed with me. The other supervisor said, don't agree with me. He could be saying something like such and such. I said, no, sir. Not going to happen. You'll never hear that come out of his lips. I won't talk like that. I promise you it won't be anything like that because I've been set apart. Yeah, come on. I've, been, I've been set apart and I'm becoming more and more bold in this, in this sanctification, this holiness that God is filling me with, this place where he's bringing me to because every single day I get up and I, and I walk out my door and I think to myself, Lord, today I want you to be sanctified and separated in my life, and I want my life to be sanctified and separated unto you. Yes, Lord. I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to sound like the world. I don't want to talk like the world. I don't want to look like the world. Yes. I don't want to act like the world. Lord, I don't want anything to do with the world. I don't want the desires for the things of the world. Yes. I don't want to be a friend of the world because the word says that if I'm a friend of the world, then I'm an enemy of God. Come on. And I know what it's like to live as an enemy of God, Help us. bound by sin. I know what it's like to lose. I know what it's like to lose because of sin. I know what it's like to, to destroy because of sin. Mm. When you destroy the things and the ones that you love because of selfishness and because of desires and the lust of the flesh. Come on. I know what it's like and I don't want it anymore. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that if you're struggling in your walk today and you find yourself removed from the altar, mm. be careful. That's my daughter right there. She turned 18 yesterday. Mm, hallelujah. The last time she saw me preach, I was she was 12 years old. Mm. And, and for the last six years, I've lived a life of destruction Help. where I've destroyed the things that God has given me. Help us. Selfishness, <laughs> fleshly desires, the lustful fleshly desires of the world, falling prey to the psychology and the, and the thoughts of the world that, that tells you your life is all about you being happy. Help us, Lord. And if you're not happy and you're not fulfilled, then, then, then you really can't be any good to those that you love. Mm. But that's a lie. As a matter of fact, the Word of God does not promise us happiness on this earth. That's right. He promises joy. Yes. yes. Peace and joy, and that's different than what the world calls happiness. That's right. Yes. What the world calls happiness is fulfilled in the flesh. Come on. It's little moments of fulfillment of, of desires of the flesh, whether it be alcohol or drugs, sexual immoralities, those different things on the inside of us that desire things that go against the very holiness and the very person of God. You know those things that tell you that you need an altar and a sacrifice. Yes. And I'm here to tell you that even as a Christian, and you all know what I'm talking about because none of us are different. We might have different desires and we might have different lusts. And some of us in the world's eyes might be a little bit better than the next one. And some of us might be a little bit worse. But the reality of the matter is, is that you're just as sinful as me, and I'm just as sinful as you. 
That's a fact. Everyone is equal at Calvary. Everyone is equal. Listen, we don't like to hear that. And the world hates to hear that. You see, because the world doesn't believe that, most Christians don't believe that they were sinners nowadays, but the world doesn't believe that they're sinners. Come on. They see the person on TV that just chopped somebody up or molested a little kid, and they think that's a sinner right there. <clears throat> and comparing themselves one to another, Come on. they become fools. Because they've made the standard of righteousness someone else. <clears throat> Instead of the standard of righteousness that he set apart. There's a standard of righteousness that God has placed in order. Do you understand that? Yes. God said this is the standard. And I want you to understand. Can I, can I look? I just found a piece of chalk a minute ago. I'm going to use it real quick. I'm going to throw on this. I'm, I'm probably not as good as an artist as Matt. <laughs> All right, that's a line. It's not straight, but it's a line. And I'm going to show you this right here. This is going to be Jesus. This is righteousness right here. Okay? And this is the most wicked, evil man in the world. And some of you might be here. And some of you might be here. And some of you might even be here. But without this, you'll always be over here. Come on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. You'll always be unrighteous. You'll always be unaccepted. You'll always be guilty on this side. And there's no way to make it to that side without the altar yes. and the sacrifice. Do you understand Amen. what I'm saying? <laughs> So we proclaim man guilty. We see the issue, what happened, what took place. We see the issues on the inside of our hearts as sinful men. And I want to tell you here this morning, this is important to me. I, I, I talk about Matt and I talk about this all the time and I talk about it all the time. But I think it's a subject that has unfortunately been left behind in, in much of the church world today. You must be born again. Yes. You've got to know that. Yes. Now I want you to understand that born again is not a prayer you said when you were six years old. Come on. Born again is an experience that takes place. And the word of God tells us that you know that this experience took place. Because that the spirit of God will be on the inside of you now bearing witness and crying out, Abba Father. Yes. He will make it personal. You'll know that God now is your father and that you're no longer an enemy of God. But now that you're a friend of God because of what he's done for you and because he's by his grace moved upon your heart. And he's he's awakened you to who he is and, 